Well, good evening. Good evening. Thank you guys so much for being here tonight. If you would, come on in and grab a seat. We're getting ready to get started here in just a second. So, again, thanks so much for coming tonight. Tonight is our Areopagus event. And I want to tell you a little bit about the event itself, kind of where it came from before I introduce to you our speaker for tonight. So in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is in, he's in Athens, in Greece. And, uh, and, and he's there and he's sharing with people. Uh, and it says that he goes to this specific spot called the Areopagus. It's also known as Mars Hill. So if you've ever been to Athens, you, you might know where the Acropolis is. You might have heard of something like the Parthenon. The Parthenon was a place where people went to go into worship. So the Acropolis, it had several different buildings where people would go and worship. Next to Acropolis, the Acropolis, was what is called Mars Hill. Mars Hill, or the Areopagus, was the place where the Stoics and the philosophers of the day would go to debate religion. They would go and they would share their ideas, they would listen to other people's ideas, they would exchange back and forth. And, and Mars Hill, or the Areopagus, overlooks the city. So, what we've decided to do with these kinds of events is to do something that we, we imagine what might have happened all the way back in the Apostle Paul's time. People getting together to learn about other religions, to talk about other religions. And what the Apostle Paul did, though, is he didn't just share about any religion. He shared about the Christian faith. And I'll read to you a little bit of this story from Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 22. It says this. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, he said, Men of Athens, I perceive in every way that you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, and I found an altar with its inscription, a tomb to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you, that the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in temples made by man, nor is he, he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives life to all mankind and breath in everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each of us, from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. In the times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That man is Christ Jesus. And what we've come to do tonight is to look at a couple of different religions side by side. I've got with us tonight Dr. George Martin. He is uh, the professor of, of Christian missions and world religions at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. A very, very educated man, very intellectual man, but also a very practical man. I've had him for two classes now, or I guess one and a half classes, and I've really enjoyed his class. So I hope that you'll be encouraged tonight. I hope that you'll be challenged. I wanted to, to tell you too, um, after Dr. Martin presents, we're going to have a, a, a time of Q&A. Up on the screen behind me is going to be a QR code. If you want to, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, we would love for it to, to relate specifically to uh, the topic at hand tonight. But if you have a question about something that ties in or maybe loosely ties in about the Christian faith, we'd love for you to ask it. Or uh, when you came in, hopefully you got a, a little card that had a, a place for you to write some of your questions. If you have questions about the Christian faith, about the Bible, about the God of the Bible, about Christ and what he's done, we would love to have a conversation with you. So please, if you have questions, ask. If you have questions, write them down. Fill those things out, turn them in. We would love to get to meet with you, take you to lunch, coffee, and have that conversation. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite Dr. Martin to come and share with us. So would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for this night. Thank you for Dr. Martin and his willingness to come and to share with us all the things that he's learned. And Lord, I pray that tonight our, our, our hearts would be challenged. Lord, I pray that you would give us understanding as we look at some of the things around us. Lord, help us to have a better understanding of what many in our world are believing. Lord, help us also to have a greater confidence in the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that you would use Dr. Martin tonight to teach us, to, to give us better understanding, but also to give us practical wisdom as to how we can have conversations with our friends, our family, those that we love, about who you are and what you have done. And we pray, Lord, that you'd be honored tonight. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Dr. Martin.
Well, let me first of all thank Hunter for the inv <clears throat> invitation to be with you this evening. And I want to thank you for sitting out here for what is supposed to be 45 minutes. I'm always amazed uh, when uh, people will sit through 45 minutes of listening to me. But um, we're going to see what we can do here this evening. I, a number of years ago, I was asked to, in about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, do a survey, present a survey of the major world religions in 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, now, I did that. I don't know what value there was to that, but um, we do have a topic that's a little bit more focused this evening. You'll see on the screens behind me, well, you, they were there, but it was there before, um, a New Age Spirituality. Um, but this is really part and parcel with a uh, larger topic of paganism, contemporary paganism. And uh, there are any number of uh, kind of subsets beneath paganism, New, new Age, um, uh, mysticism, spiritism, various types of uh, groups, but th they all have very much in common. And we, I think we can place them under this large umbrella of paganism. Now, those who would identify as pagan today do not see that term as pejorative. Uh, as a negative, but rather they will tend to use the term to speak of a very specific uh, set of beliefs, a very uh, specific way of living one's life, and uh, they would use the term not in a negative or pejorative sense of themselves, but they would use it very positively and proudly. But there is what we call today paganism. And in many ways this evening, what we are doing is we're talking about worldviews. Worldviews. Uh, more specifically, about a clash of worldviews. Many of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis and his uh, very well-known book, The Screwtape Letters, in which the demon Screwtape, he writes these letters to his nephew Wormwood, instructing him on how to tempt uh, his I think the term that Lewis uses to tempt his patient, um, to tempt this individual, this wayward soul on earth, to tempt him into the bosom of our Lord below. And so this is satanic temptation. And um, Lewis acknowledges in this book this uh, contrast between worldviews. Uh, one worldview that acknowledges the reality of the supernatural and another which denies his existence. For instance, Lewis writes, um, and this is uh, screw tape speaking to Wormwood, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them, two extremes. They don't exist, or I'm just absolutely consumed by, um, uh, by them. And the fear that that brings, they themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Uh, so Lewis is simply acknowledging that in these conversations, we can go to great extremes denying reality or uh, so focused on the truth of something that uh, we forget the great helps and encouragements that God gives us in his word and in his gospel um, to fight against these errors. Ronald Nash, Dr. Ronald Nash was the first head of the philosophy and religion department here at Western Kentucky University many years ago. I got to know him back in the late 1980s uh, when uh, my family and I lived in Louisville. Dr. Nash taught um, at uh, Western Kentucky, I believe, for 27 years. Uh, he left uh, the, um, uh, his role there to go to Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. When they opened the Orlando campus of that school, he moved there. And in the last few years of his life, I believe he died in 2006, I believe that's correct. But in those last few years of his life, he actually held a dual appointment. He was full-time professor of philosophy at RTS in Orlando and also full-time 
uh, professor of um, uh, philosophy at Southern Seminary in Louisville, and he would fly back and forth every week. So I got to know Dr. Nash pretty well. Uh, but Dr. Nash defined worldview very simply. A worldview is a set of beliefs about the most important issues in life. That's not a, now we could expand on that. We can come up with other definitions. I could give you other definitions, but I like that one. I like simple definitions. Um, a set of beliefs about the most important issues in life. We must acknowledge that there are different worldviews and that in this world, there are worldviews that oppose one another, that contradict one another. In fact, the biblical writers allude to this reality, don't they? Let me just remind you that in some instances, <clears throat> Christian thought is simply portrayed as opposite to the ways of the world. Now, I don't have time. <laughs> um, Hunter's not giving me time to uh, read much scripture here this evening. So um, I do have scriptures here and I could give you a number of these, but I'm just summarizing. In some instances, Christian thought is simply portrayed as opposite to the ways of the world. On other occasions, the New Testament writers specifically refer to a clash between Christian and Greek ideas. I'm gonna come back to that in just a moment. And seeing them as incompatible. Um, and these Greek and Christian worldviews in Paul's day existed side by side, in the same place, amongst the same peoples, in close proximity geographically. Um, and uh, those leaders, uh, the leaders of these different worldview groups certainly understood their worldviews as, as uh, fundamentally irreconcilable with of the Greek with the Christian, the Christian with the Greek. In fact, the Apostle Paul gets at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me read this text. I think it's a very important one for us this evening as we begin. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, and it means here worldly wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, I think the Apostle Paul is probably describing most of us in the room here this evening. Um, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Some of us are awfully glad of that, aren't we? He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul clearly sets the preaching of the cross over against the wisdom of this world uh, and sees a contradiction between the two and understands that the two uh, uh, worldviews are fundamentally uh, incompatible. Now, I need to acknowledge right up front this evening that I'm approaching our topic from a, an unapologetically um, uh, biblical, what I would call evangelical 
perspective, as we talk about New Age spiritism, as we talk about uh, paganism and this worldview that is set over against the gospel and the biblical worldview. Um, in the late 19th century, Dr. Nash uses this illustration in his little book, uh, Worldviews in Conflict. Uh, but in, in the 19th century, Stephen Crane, uh, I, I, uh, college students are here. I, I, do you recognize that? Anyone recognize that name? Wrote a very famous novel. You guys don't read this stuff anymore. <laughs> Stephen Crane, Hunter, ah, The Red Badge of Courage, you might recognize that. Now, it's, it's a novel from Civil War time, Civil War days, but very famous novel, novel in um, American history, but he was also a poet of sorts. And he, uh, in a, uh, a collection of poems entitled War is Kind and Other Lines, he wrote this. A man said to the universe, um, imagine this, picture this, a man, an individual, man, a woman standing at night before the universe and looking up, speaking to the universe, sir, look at me, I exist. However, replied the universe, that fact has not created in me a sense of obligation. Oh my goodness. How different is this perspective on human beings from that which we find, for instance, in Psalm 8, as the psalmist begins, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I almost want to sing that, you know, that little chorus that we uh, take from that verse. And, uh, and the psalmist goes on to describe human beings as created just a bit beneath the heavenly beings and above all other beings created by God in his image, endowed with dignity and purpose. Um, how different is that perspective on human beings? Which is one of those basic worldview questions. Who am I? What am I? How different is that perspective from the perspective we find in that little poem from Crane. Here I am. Look at me. What are you? Nothing. And there are all sorts of practical, real world consequences that flow from those different worldviews, aren't there? Oh, we could talk about many of the issues that are before us today in our culture. But two very different worldviews, two very different perspectives on human beings, who we are, what we are. There's a world of difference between those two universes. Um, today, uh, we live in a context in which um, we read headlines such as some of these that I'll give you here, some recent headlines from the New York Times, the headline, The Return of Paganism, from uh, Quartz, uh, publication Quartz, the U.S. witch population has seen an astro astronomical rise. I was I had an opportunity uh, just a few years ago. I had a, <laughs> a young lady in the back, and I we were talking earlier about our ages, and um, um, I, this was a mom who I had as a student years ago at Southern, and. By the time this story comes around, her daughter had grown up and was a student at the University of Louisville. And this lady called me one day and she said, Dr. Martin, uh, my daughter has become a good friend with a young lady who is a Wiccan. And uh, would you like to talk with her? I said, yeah, I, I, I would very much like to do that. And, and so uh, the mom and her daughter and the young lady, her name was Desiree, and I, we met at a coffee shop, in a coffee shop there on Bardstown Road in Louisville, and almost a two-hour conversation. It, it, was, it was fascinating. Now, obviously, again, Hunter's not giving me much time tonight. I can't tell you all of that conversation, but I'll tell you part of it. At one point, I just asked her, I said, are there many 
witches, are there many Wiccans? Now, she made a clear distinction between the two, but that's another conversation for another day. But um, I said, are there many here in Louisville? And her eyes got big and with excitement, she said, oh yes, we are everywhere. And she began to name some of the places, uh, business establishments and other places where uh, they hung out and, you know, drank coffee and, and, and just uh, enjoyed one another's fellowship. And she said, oh yes, there are many of us. Now, I don't, when I was in college, I don't know if someone would have said that, would have made that statement, that observation, but she certainly did. Um, uh, here's the thing. Uh, what we're talking about tonight is very much with us today. Uh, modern paganism, modern uh, spiritism, mysticism, new age spiritualism, uh, spirituality. Um, another uh, publication entitled Big Think uh, had the headline, Could Neo-Paganism Be the New Religion of America? Uh, I talked with uh, Dr. Bruce Connell, a recent PhD graduate of Southern Seminary, teaches at Crown College in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, I read that uh, title to him and he immediately answered, remember the title, Could Neo-Paganism Be the New Religion of America? He immediately responded, I believe it has a good shot. It's all around us, um, everywhere that we look. Um, things are changing from kind of a um, scientific materialism toward this eclectic, just borrowing from uh, all sorts of um, systems and worldviews and thought, uh, this eclectic spiritism, and we see it everywhere. We see it in the rise, the popularity of magic uh, more and more. We see it in new age thinking. I keep thinking new age is on the screen behind me. Um, we see it in the revival of the occult. We see it all around us. So a number of years ago, uh, Don and I were living in uh, Nashville, actually Franklin, Tennessee, just on the south side of Nashville. And uh, there in, on the west side of Nashville is the Tennessee State Penitentiary for Women. And boy, they've got some bad, they have some bad cases in there. In fact, uh, we talked with some of these ladies. I mean, just horrendous things. And the, the lady who contacted me, she was in charge of the uh, devotional times for the women in the penitentiary. And she asked me, she said, Dr. Martin, would you come and spend one evening with us, two hour, about two hours, and just a Q&A? This question and answer. She said, this is a state penitentiary. And so by law, I cannot, th this lady was an evangelical believer, but she said, by law, I cannot confine my uh, invitations only to evangelicals. Once I bring in anyone from any religious perspective, the door is open to everyone. And these ladies have heard from so many different, have heard from so many different perspectives. They're just absolutely confused. Would you come and just two hours, question and answer? And I thought, wow, yeah, I, that's gonna, I, I'm, really, I'm looking forward to that. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, all right, these are some ladies, they've done terrible things, you know, and um, what an opportunity to speak about redemption. What an opportunity to talk about the gospel and how the gospel changes lives and um, brings reconciliation uh, not only between us and God, but between people. Oh my goodness. So we, Don and I show up there. I'm excited as I can be. First question out of the gate, lady in the back, there were about 70 or 80 women in the audience. First question out of the gate, um, Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, um, could you tell us who were the Nephilim in Genesis six? Now, I'm, we're not going to go back and read uh, Genesis 6 this evening. Again, Hunter's not given me enough time to do that. But um, uh, I can tell you that her belief was that the Nephilim were offspring of angelic beings, spiritual beings who had come down from heaven and had had relationships with human women, and the offspring were these hybrid People, uh, half, I guess, half 
angelic, half spirit, and half human. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it took us a while to get to the gospel. Um, and uh, we, we had, oh my goodness, the conversation we had there. Oh, I, I wish I had time to talk with you about that conversation and just walk you through it, but I, uh, but I can't. But I will tell you, uh, as, I, as she asked the question, I noticed in the crowd that many of the women were shaking their heads vertically in affirmation, uh, in agreement with this young lady, wanting to know. Uh, and, and agreeing with her that the Nephilim were these hybrid spirit human offspring. Of course, the first question that came to my mind was, well, how do you spot them? I mean, what do they look like? I, but anyway, well, I had a, the second question was not much better. We finally spent a little bit of time on the gospel and just this wonderful news of redemption. You know, I thought, I, I, I was sure this is what ladies were going to ask about. You know, I've done terrible things. You know, I've been in contact with a family and they, they have forgiven me. Um, I'm paying my, I'm paying uh, the, the penalty uh, to society here in the time I'm spending in jail. I, I'm okay with all that. I'm just wondering, can God ever forgive me? I thought those were the questions I was going to get. Oh my goodness. As we were walking out later, Donna turned to me and she said, she asked me, you know what happened back there just now, don't you? I said, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Could you tell me? She said, well, i tell you what that was. Those ladies were so caught up in the prevailing culture in which the stories are told of spirit beings and human beings, women, young women falling in love with spirit beings, and, and just this mixing of the spiritual world with the physical world um, in, in physical contact, and just uh, the, 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 all the spiritism and mythology. They, were so, they are so caught up in that rising worldview that they had no problem understanding that an angelic being would come down and have relationships with a woman, human woman, and produce some sort of hybrid offspring. And I think Donna was right. I think that's what we were wrestling with that evening, this prevailing culture that is all around us. Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, as the people were getting ready to go into the promised land, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, he gave them some instruction. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Now the question that is automatically going to arise for us is, why are these things abominations to the Lord? Well, I think the answers are fairly clear. Um, because the Lord, their God, is the one who has given them their sons and their daughters, and it's the one who prioritizes life, not death. He takes no pleasure in the killing, the sacrificing of children. Why? Because the Lord, their God, is the one who directs their steps and who instructs them according to his perfect wisdom and his perfect goodness. They have no need to turn to any other. Their God has instructed them and instructed them perfectly. And he has done so out of his goodness and his wisdom and his love. It's a terrible thing for them to look elsewhere. Now, I need to move on very quickly this evening, but I want to place the rest of our conversation 
under this big umbrella term of paganism. The problem that, or we could, oh, they put New Age spiritualism back up there, Christianity and New Age spiritualism. Um, you know, you, I, I say that enough times and they put it back up there on the screen. If I complain enough times that Hunter's not giving me enough time this evening, he might come around and give me another hour. You just never know, do you? And so, um, but, so um, a, a definition of paganism or new, new age spiritualism. Here's one of the, pro here's, I, here's really the problem I think we face. And that's the question of whether we can even provide a final essential definition of one of these. For instance, if we, uh, once we define paganism as A, or New Ageism as A, and then we come across something that looks almost like A, but is a little bit different, we have to tweak our definition, we have, then we have to say, well, it is A plus B. And we think we've nailed it until we come across something that's a little bit different, and then we have to say, well, it's A plus B plus C. And that's a, a, a real problem for us in by way of essential definition. Many of you will have heard of the very famous uh, uh, case that came before the United States Supreme Court in 1964, and the um, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart uh, was asked uh, to describe his threshold. It was a, it was a, um, a, um, a case on uh, some aspect of obscenity. And he was asked to give a, if, could you give us a definition, kind of a threshold? That's another way of saying, just at your essential definition of obscenity. What is it? Can you nail it down for us? Do any of you know what he said? You know the response? Very famous response. I don't know that I can give such a definition, but I know it when I see it. That's sort of where we are when it comes to many of these um, uh, religious systems and philosophies that we're talking about this evening. We sort of know these things when we see them, don't we? Now, typically from a Christian and biblical perspective, a pagan would simply be a person holding religious beliefs contrary to biblical Christianity. There are Christians and there are pagans. There are believers and there are those who do not believe. And that's a pretty simple uh, line to draw. Uh, such a definition is based, first of all, I think, on the first of the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. There is no other God than the God of the Bible. And the belief in or the following after another God is seen to be error and uh, falsehood. Uh, and, and so th th this distinction biblically, but of course we can expand our understanding uh, of paganism uh, to a broader context of the religions of the world and reference anyone holding religious beliefs other than those of the main world religions. That, that is, we now are in the realm of uh, beauties in the eye of the beholder. And so uh, for the Hindu, anything that would um, contradict essential Hindu teaching might be considered a pagan, certainly a non-Hindu. You could do the same sort of thing with a Muslim or a, a Buddhist or uh, a Sikh or whoever, uh, however we might fill in the blank. And so uh, anyone holding a religious belief that is contrary to that of the dominant religion um, in today, of course, in today's culture, which emphasizes so strongly this matter of tolerance to suggest that one religion is better than another, to suggest that any one way is better than another or is the way is to invite ridicule and even worse. I mean, in our context today, you just don't do that. You know, it's kind of a, I'm okay, you're okay. Um, I believe what I believe, you believe what you believe, and that's fine. Uh, th this matter of tolerance. And so it's very difficult uh, in the larger culture for us to draw these sorts of lines without facing ridicule, and as I put it, even worse. 
Um, that is to hold up one religion as barometer of truth to which all others must be evaluated, by which all others must be evaluated is to invite accusations of bigotry and arrogance. Well, you're just a bigot. Um, you're just being arrogant. Who are you to suggest that you have the truth? Of course, biblically, the religion of Yahweh or Jehovah, the religion of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> Biblically is understood not only as truth, but as the truth. And so from a biblical perspective, a pagan would be anyone who rejects biblical religion for another. But again, today the terms pagan and paganism um, are less and less used in this matter, manner. That is, I think they are less and less used with any reference at all to biblical religion. Many who will identify as pagan or following paganism, being a part of paganism, um, will do so with little or no knowledge, certainly little or no interest in biblical religion, not even on the radar screen. They will likely not define themselves uh, uh, in terms of opposition to biblical religion. They're just not even interested in it. And I think that's where we are today. Um, in fact, uh, rather, according to uh, one website, patheos.com, paganism, with capital A, you see, this is um, um, to emphasize uh, the formality of all this, paganism represents a wide variety of traditions that emphasize reverence for nature and a revival of ancient polytheistic and animistic religious practices. A wide variety of traditions, including New Age spiritualism. We're back to this matter of definition. Well, we, we think we've defined it, and then we find something that doesn't look quite like our definition, so we have to uh, tweak our definition. Then we find something else and something else. And, um, but right here, someone might say to me, well, George, um, it just seems to be so arrogant for any one person to claim the truth, to claim to have the truth. I mean, that really is the context in which we live today, but it must be so across the religious landscape. My Buddhist friend, if he understands his religion rightly and he understands mine and the gospel rightly, he must say to me, I cannot accept your gospel. It is inconsistent with my religion. And of course, many do. My Hindu friend must say to me, I cannot accept your gospel because it is inconsistent with my religion. My Muslim friend must say to me, I cannot accept your gospel. It is inconsistent with my religion. Now, I understand my friend's commitment to his or her religion. I, I get this. And I can applaud my friend's correct understanding about the ultimate incompatibility of his religion with mine. Um, they are different in their essences. And this is not to try to turn one against another in hatred and conflict, but only to acknowledge the ultimate incompatibility in their fundamental essences of the different religions, paganism, ancient and contemporary, simply is incompatible with biblical Christianity. They are not the same. Now, even as we affirm this reality, I think winsomeness, that's not a word we use much anymore, is it? To be winsome, is to be gracious, is to be um, kind, is to be gentle in our speech, in our approach. Um, but even as we affirm these great divides, we all must note that winsomeness should be the flavor of the day in our conversation. Not ugliness, not mean-spiritedness. Furthermore, at the end of the day, and at the, at the end of the conversation, and at the end of the day, I must show a willingness to leave my friend to his or her own position. Which does not mean, by the way, that I will not argue my position with passion. Which does not mean, by the way, that I will not 
uh, not only apologize for my position, argue for my position, but point out what I think is the wrongness of the, the competing position. But I will do so with winsomeness. I will do so with graciousness. I think this is what God would have us to do. Uh, David Rogers, an attorney in Greer, South Carolina, a number of years ago, um, was addressing um, this sort of thing, and he wrote this. Christian evangelism should always be respectful, loving, and kind, yet faithful to the truth of the gospel. Christians should always present the gospel in a winsomely, there's our word again, in a winsomely persuasive manner. To be sure, Christians have not always done so. But evangelism at its best is carried out with the heartfelt desire and hope that others would enter into the abundant life and salvation found only in Christ. From the Christian perspective, there is nothing of greater value for any person than knowing Christ as Lord. And such a view is not pointless, it is the point. Winsomeness, gracious persuasion, gracious argument. Well, again, if I had time this evening, I would try to introduce you to some of the um, authors, well-known authors in paganism and New Ageism. Um, I'm going to come back to one uh, at the end of my time here in just a few minutes. But um, back to definition just for a moment. Uh, paganism claim, tends to claim to be an old religion that predates Hinduism and all the Abrahamic religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. I looked up some definitions. The Pagan Federation International defines paganism as a polytheistic or pantheistic nature-worshiping religion. The BBC, uh, in um, a presentation entitled Paganism at a Glance, defines paganism as a group of contemporary religions based on a reverence for nature. And then the Catholic Encyclopedia uh, tells us that in the broadest sense, paganism includes all religions other than the one true one revealed by God. And in a narrower sense, all except Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, the term is also used as the equivalent of polytheism. So different definitions, you see how this works. It just, um, it, it's kind of, it gets a bit fuzzy. But let's, let's let um, others speak for themselves. So the Pagan, Pagan Federation International, uh, you can join this group. And they, there are three principles that you must affirm for membership in this group. Number one, love for and kinship with nature. All, seems like always nature. Um, I'm, I'm, call, I'm shortening these uh, just a bit. Why is that? That's right, Hunter's not giving me enough time to um, give you uh, much more than this. Um, secondly, a positive morality in which the individual is responsible for the discovery and development of the true nature in harmony with the outer world and community. It's all about me, just personal discovery and pilgrimage. Um, often expressed as do what you will as long as it harms none. This is a very well-known um, um, uh, affirmation in, in paganism and the various uh, philosophies that we would place uh, beneath that uh, term. Um, and then uh, th this same site provides a number of general characteristics. And this would include New Ageism. It would include various types of spiritism. Um, but all of this under paganism, um, gen general characteristics. Um, the religion is seen as the ancestral religion of the whole of humanity. There is often the claim that... Um, uh, this goes all the way back to the beginning. This is the religion out of which all others have sprung. This is the root religion, religious system and worldview of human beings. Um, another characteristic, earth and everything in it is seen as sacred. And the whole system of ethics flows from this. Often polytheistic. Um, often uh, references and uh, priorities, prior, uh, priority on uh, the goddess, the feminine face of divinity, kind of in opposition to God as father. Uh, there are other characteristics, often um, the mention of ancestral deities, local and national heroes, 
Um, there you'll read phrases such as the spirit of the hearth. Um, um, uh, you, you'll find magic, augury, divination. In, in fact, many of the things that Moses spoke of there in Deuteronomy 18 that were prohibited for the Israelites. I guess all this, for me, all this is sort of to say, when we talk about paganism, when we talk about modern spiritism, when we talk about new age spirituality, what's the old adage? Nothing new under the sun. Been here, done this. Um, so much that seems new to us today, it's been around for a long time. It was there in the days of the apostles. It was there uh, in Greece and Rome. It was there in ancient Egypt. Uh, uh, it has been there uh, in cultures across the world for untold generations. Um, I have just a, a few minutes here. I, I really want to talk in by talking about engaging pagans and again, a, a pagan, a professing pagan would not see this, as I understand it, would not see my characterization or naming of him or her as pagan, uh, would not see that as pejorative. Uh, it speaks to a very specific set of beliefs, a very specific way of living, um, uh, very, speaks very specifically to uh, relationships, but I do have several points that I'd like to close with this evening as we think about um, as Christians, evangelical Christians with the gospel, just um, thinking about engaging our friends with the gospel. Um, several points. Number one, I need to be convinced of biblical teaching. I, that, that's foundational. I must be convinced that this is truth. I must be convinced uh, of the teaching that there is one God. And I must be convinced uh, about who he is and what he is like. I must be convinced that there is just one way to God. And that is through his son, Jesus Christ. Um, I must be convinced that as a believer, it is my responsibility to take this good news to others and even to the nations. I must be convinced that other religions in their fundamental essences are incompatible with the gospel. The gospel, in other words, the gospel is unique. There's nothing like it in the world. I must be convinced of this. So that's the first thing. I, I must be convinced of biblical teaching. A second point I would make, as we engage our friends in conversation, we need to do so with the right attitude. We are seeking to relate to people and to win people, not merely to win arguments. And so we patiently and respectfully answer questions and spend time with our friends. Third, prayer. Uh, we, at the end of the day, some of you can testify of this. You've, you've arrayed all your best arguments. You've got all your best illustrations if you've, and you've used them. In, in the conversation with a friend. You've broken out all the, uh, the uh, pertinent biblical text. I mean, you have laid it on the line. I remember doing this one time with a high school buddy. So much wanted him to, to know the Lord. And I thought at the end of my presentation, wow, how can he say no? And it was like I just hit a wall. I, I, I fully expected him to say, I believe. And he looked at me and he said, so? And at some point we realize that we are not the ones who open the eyes or unstop the ears. We are not the ones who take the old heart of stone out and put in its place a heart alive unto God, but it is the Lord who does that. And if he is the Lord of the harvest, then we will find ourselves often praying for our friends that the Lord will open eyes and unstop ears and give understanding and draw to the gospel. Prayer. And ask others to pray with us. Fourth, honor the process. What I mean by this is we, we must be patient. We must trust the Holy Spirit and the work and the word of God to work. And the word of God will, the promise of Isaiah 55 is that the word of God will not return into him void, 
But it will accomplish all that he sends it to do. Trust the process. Trust the gospel. The gospel, Paul tells us in Romans 1, 16, is the power of God unto salvation. To all who believe, first the Jew, then the Gentile. Trust the gospel. Trust the process. Number five, understand the spiritual battle. It's interesting that uh, Bruce Connell uh, discovered this and shared it with me. 26 of the 27 books of the New Testament warn against false teaching. We have an adversary who seeks to destroy and hold people in bondage. Uh, we must understand the battle that we are involved in. Number six, use the Bible. Testimony is great. We always want to share testimonies. But oh my goodness, it is the Word of God. It is the gospel itself that convinces. Use the Bible. Gently use the power of God's Word. People should be convinced by the truth of Scripture, not by our clever arguments. Use Scripture. And finally, I would just counsel for gospel clarity. Seek to make the gospel as clear as possible. Present the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus as central over and over and over again. Gently call our friends to repentance for their sin and to faith in Jesus uh, and the gospel. Um, call them to faith. Share the joy of forgiveness and the blessed hope that is found in Jesus of eternal life. Um, gospel clarity. Now, I am 40 seconds over, but I'm going to tell a quick story. In closing. So I have a, a student who in doing some research for a couple of years in the city in which he lives um, uh, weekly began to meet with witches and Wiccans in his community and they had this coffee coven that they would meet and they drink coffee and they fellowship as witches and Wiccans and uh, he really uh, got to know them well one of the um, um, individuals involved in this coven uh, was, is one of the uh, most highly respected academics and scholars in the pagan community in North America. And as my friend tells the story, he said he was meeting one week, just getting to know these folks, and he, they knew who he was. They knew he was a, a believer. And, um, but at one point, one of the uh, uh, Wiccan priestesses, she turned to him and, and called the name of this academic, this scholar, and said she's really having a hard time. She's having a hard time with her teaching um, position and in her personal life. She is just really struggling. Would you mind calling her and seeing if you can help her? Now, folks, that to me is the most amazing story a Wiccan asking a, an evangel conservative evangelical pastor to call one of the most renowned pagan scholars in North America and counsel her. What in the world was going on there? Well, I, I tell you, I think one thing that was going on is that my friend was spending time with these folks. You know, um, I not that long ago at Baxter Avenue Baptist Church where I serve as pastor in Louisville, I preached through the Gospel of Mark. And one thing that just jumped out at me from Mark's Gospel, oh my goodness, is that Jesus was always with the people. He was always with the people. Even when he tried to get away from them for some quiet time, they followed him. He never was away from the people. He was always with the people. We find ourselves sometimes always, sometimes looking for the latest, greatest fad coming down the pike. The, the latest, greatest program of evangelism, um, the, 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 just the right structure to use, you know, just the right outline to use by way of presentation. We, we just, and when one doesn't work, we look for the next one. And when that doesn't quite work, we look for the next, always looking for that silver bullet. Well, let me tell you, if there's a silver bullet, I would argue it's the gospel. Just give them the gospel. But in order to give them the gospel, what must we do? We must spend time with them. And that might be a lot of time. And I think that's our failure right there. 
I think we don't spend, uh, forget for just a moment our topic of paganism and new age spiritualism, just people in general. We do not spend time with them. But if we were to spend time with people and get to know them, they get to know us. Like my friend, wouldn't it be something if a pagan one day turned to you and said, I have this pagan friend and she's just really struggling. Oh my goodness. I I see something in you that, uh, would you mind giving her a call and just talking with her? Spending time with people. Spending time with our friends who identify in these ways and give them the gospel. We need to pray. Our Father, how short has the time been this evening, but our prayer and our confidence is that you have met with us by your Holy Spirit. And Father, that you will do something with, through this time and with this time that you have given us together. Father, how sweet is the gospel. It is wonderful good news. You have given it to us who are believers, not that we would hold it for ourselves merely. Certainly we enjoy the blessings of the gospel, but also that we would give it away. And Father, may we go from this place and this time this evening stirred up and with a greater sense of urgency and a greater passion just to spend time with people, our friends, our neighbors, our schoolmates, our colleagues, and winsomely and graciously talking with them and bringing the wonderful gospel into those conversations. The gospel that is powerful unto salvation. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank Dr. Martin for uh, spending some time with us tonight. (laughs) What do you want, try here? Yeah, if you want to go ahead and grab a seat. I know that I'm the worst. I've been made well aware already by uh, a few of the, the questions that have been asked. Ben, would you mind to throw up the QR code for us one more time? If you guys have questions, uh, we're going to take about 10 or 15 minutes or so uh, to do some Q&A questions. If you want to go ahead and scan this, it'll take you to uh, something that's called a Slido. You can send some questions. We'll go through as many of these as we can uh, in the amount of time that we've got. So some of these may be quick. Some of these may be... As long as they ask questions that I can answer. As long as they are questions that Dr. Martin can answer. So we'll go ahead and get started. This first one I think is uh, pretty good and you kind of ended with this. You talked about the, the, the significance of giving the scriptures. And this question says, what would you say to someone who doesn't believe that the Bible is true, seeing as that's the foundation for everything that we believe? So how would you approach a conversation with another person who uh, says that I don't believe what the Bible says? Well, I, what I would do, I think, is I would, first of all, tell the story of the Bible. Uh, I, it is... Uh, I think many who would make that argument or or ask that question do not even know what is in the Bible. Uh, And so why would they believe that it is truth? They don't know anything about it. They've heard stories about the Bible. They've heard people complain about the Bible, um, you know, this and that, accuse the Bible. I think the first thing that I would do is, is, and, and you can do this quickly, by the way, but the more time that you have, um, the more you can do with this, but I think it would be very important to take my friend through the story of the Bible beginning uh, with what? The beginning. In fact, uh, Michael Goheen, a number of years ago, Old Testament scholar, he wrote an article uh, entitled, The Urgency of Reading the Bible as One Story. Um, We tend to think of the Bible as two stories. You know, it's that old story. And then there's the new story. Um, it's actually one story, isn't it? And it really does hold together. That's something, I think that's important for someone to see. Um, uh, and when I've taught Old Testament at Southern, I, I try to re- uh, draw the um, 
uh, connection between the two. And the way that I often do it is simply to observe that the Old Testament is primary, primarily promise of what or whom? Messiah. You go all the way back to the beginning, chap early chapters of Genesis, and you begin to see uh, prophecies pointing toward one who will come. Uh, but the promise of Messiah, the New Testament, is fulfillment. The coming of the Mas Messiah has come. And there's just something about seeing the story and seeing how it hangs together and seeing the beauty and the, um, uh, and, uh, of the story that is very convincing. Now, look, um, there are all sorts of apologetic arguments we can get into. Um, I just never have found those all that effective. Um, I'm, if you're, you're asking me, you're not asking one of my scholarly colleagues at Southern Seminary, uh, what would I do? I think I'd tell them the story and then have a conversation about the story. What is it about this that so troubles you? What is it about this that doesn't seem to fit? And just have that conversation. That's good, thank you. Uh, this, the next question, this has gotten a lot of uh, upvotes on here. Uh, the question is about angel numbers. Are you familiar with angel numbers? Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with angel numbers? Could you help us to understand exactly what that means uh, and how that fits with, uh, I don't know anything about angel numbers, so. I don't either, <laughs> would someone help me with that? I mean, you got a lot of thumbs up. I did get a lot of thumbs up. Angel numbers. Angel numbers. Okay, so you're just talking numerology. Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Secret? It's, not, it's, like, yeah. it's like you look at the clock or you look at your thumb and it's the same time. So like, you'll see like 10 twos and then you'll see like 10 So you look at your phone, you look at numbers and you see patterns. Yes. And, and that supposedly is uh, some sort of message maybe from uh, a divine figure, uh, from some spirit or whatever. Ah, angel numbers. I know the concept, I did not know the, the terminology. Um, well, what would I say about that? Um, I would say this, that uh, in the scriptures, and Paul writes this to young Timothy, and he applauds him for, um, for his knowledge of the, uh, of the scriptures and his faithfulness to the scriptures. He has been taught the scriptures by his grandmother and by his mother. And Paul goes on to explain that it is the scriptures that are able to make you wise and are able to equip the person, the man of God, the person of God to every good work. God speaks to us through the scriptures. Um, and so number patterns, um, cloud formations in the sky. These are the sorts of, as, as I understand it, these are the sorts of uh, divinational things that Moses explicitly prohibits in Deuteronomy 18. You are not, we are not to look to these things, but rather to the Word of God as uh, directed by the Holy Spirit and um, uh, uh, confirmed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it, and, and, and of course, this is a problem for many of us we uh, look in many, many places for a, a word from God. We put out our fleeces. We look for patterns and numbers. We look for this and that. Uh, and I would simp my answer simply would be, we need to spend much more time in the word of God finding the answers there. The answers are there. In fact, could I tell a quick story? Mm -hmm. So I was in Jakarta, Indonesia, and I was sharing the gospel uh, with a Muslim gentleman. And at one point he said to me, he asked, why would I trade my religion for yours? Why would I trade my book, the Quran, for your book, the Bible? Your book is only concerned about Sunday morning. My book is concerned about all of life. It tells me how to order my family. It tells me how to run my business. It tells me how to loan money and borrow money. It tells me how to relate to the government. It tells me how to do this and that. It is concerned with all of life. Your book is only concerned about Sunday morning. Where did he get that notion? I, I, you're asking me questions. Let me turn around and ask you a question. Where did he get that notion? 
that the Bible is only concerned about Sunday morning. He got it from cultural Christianity. He, he saw many professing Christians go into the churches on Sunday morning, get their dose of religion, go out the rest of the week and live like the world, like anything but a Christian, a biblical Christian. My book, though, tells me about all of life. Well, my response is, oh, no, no, no. You do not understand the Bible. The Bible speaks to all of life. There is a primary message. The message of redemption and salvation, forgiveness of sins um, in, in Messiah. Uh, uh, as Paul put it, we preach Christ and him crucified. There is a primary message. The angel said to Joseph, your betrothed Mary is with child by the Holy Spirit and she's going to give birth to a son and you shall call his name Jesus, which means the Lord saves because he will save his people from their sins. It is for this that Jesus has come into the world primarily. And the Bible tells us this, but the Bible speaks to all of life. It is there that we must go for counsel and direction. And when we start looking elsewhere, that seems to me to be problematic. Following up with that question is, uh, here's a question um, about someone who has turned from paganism to Christ. Have you met someone or, or maybe even led someone from paganism or, or any of the other kind of forms of this conversation we've been talking about to the Christian faith? And if so, have you had a, a conversation about what's been the hardest thing for them in their transition from one faith to the next, particularly I've, related to I this? have had conversation, I've not had a lot of conversations with someone coming from uh, paganism to the gospel. Um, there is a book, and I forget her, Margaret, I forget her last name, but she writes about her personal journey from Mormonism to the gospel. And she writes about all this baggage that she carried into uh, the Christian life from her former life and how difficult that was. Um, I, I think for someone coming out of paganism to the gospel that it, it is very difficult. I have talked with uh, some and, and, and a big part of this is community. Um, it's not only doctrinal issues, you know, casting aside, putting off the errors of thinking and the errors of doctrine and putting on truth. But it is, I tell you, the thing that seems to come out over and over again is the matter of community. They, I've heard Professor Desiree talked about this, about how the community that she found with Wiccans, how they accepted her. Um, and encouraged her and walked with her. Somebody coming out of paganism, so like somebody coming off death row, they come into our church and we kind of, what's our natural tendency? Kind of, you know. Um, and al almost uh, from the get-go, from the beginning, feel ostracized, feel different. Here's the problem, or here's the challenge for us, though, is to see that all of us bring our baggage to the gospel. And we are all, as Paul puts it, putting off and putting on. I was, this not at Southern Seminary, it was another school, but it was a faculty meeting and we were having to decide something very important. And one of the uh, ladies, she taught English uh, in the university and uh, she had only about three or four years earlier um, uh, believed the gospel and become a Christian. And she had lived a hard life. And she was in her late 40s when she came to Christ. And she began to speak to this issue with passion. I mean, and suddenly she let fly the string of expletives, curse words, blah, 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 blah. And she caught herself. <laughs> and she said, oh, wait a minute. Um, I'm a follower of Jesus now. I don't talk like that anymore. But just the difficulty of putting off that which is in opposition to the gospel, that which is in opposition to Christ, it's more difficult than many of us might think. And it just adds to the difficulty when we react so, like, you know, kind of pull back. Um, I think that sense of community, that sense of actually being one with the church is one of the greatest challenges. I mean, you were a pagan. I mean, you were a witch. 
It's hard for some of us, but Paul, the apostle, would remind us, every one of us as believers, from where we have come, dead in our sins and trespasses. We don't have anything over this lady who has come out of witchcraft to the gospel. Our beginnings were just as bad as hers, but we tend to, and that, that oh man, that's tough. Just to, to find community in the church. And when, the, when this person does not find it, they just resort back to other paths. Reminds me a little bit of what Paul said. There's no distinction. We're all in Christ. Yeah, that's right. We are yeah. in Christ. Uh, this is a, another really um, highly voted on question. It's uh, about the concept of selling your soul. That's a, a fairly common uh, or popularized uh, phrase, especially in, seems to be in the music or uh, television mm -hmm. industry. Um, can you explain a little bit of what, what does it mean, or I guess what have you seen when, when people are saying that they're selling their soul? And um, Well, yeah. I, I think what is meant by that, and somebody, certainly you're welcome to correct me if I'm thinking wrongly, but I think what people think of when they use that terminology, to sell my soul to the devil, is I give my full loyalty to the devil. In turn, he gives me something. He gives me a skill, you know. Um, I always wanted to be, I mean, just this famous rock musician. I, I don't have the skill, but sell my soul to the devil, and he gives me that ability. I think that's the way we, we talk, uh, that we think about the phrase. Uh, I'm not sure where, I'm not sure that we find that phrase, that particular phrase in the scriptures. What we do find in the scriptures is the reality that Satan goes about like a roaring lion seeking to um, capture, to enslave all that he can, everyone that he can. He's the prince of darkness. Uh, he's the father of lies. And um, uh, in the broadest general sense, to sell one's soul, I would, I would not use that terminology. Um, in fact, uh, I think we can clearly make the biblical argument that anyone who has rejected the gospel, using that terminology or not, that person's soul is already in the grip of Satan, already in darkness, already dead. Um, so I, you're right, this is a kind of a popular theme. I, I, I know some movies in which mm -hmm. I've, I've seen this and, and some writings, but um, I don't think it's a particularly biblical concept in the sense of, hey, um, um, I'm going to buy that ability or I'm going to buy that new house or that new um, yacht by uh, selling my soul to the devil so that he'll give it to me. I, I don't know that that specifically is found in the scriptures. But left on our own, apart from the sovereign work of God's grace in our lives, just naturally, we are all sold out to the devil. We're all sold out to Satan. We're all sold out to sin. That's the urgency of the gospel, isn't it? It is the gospel that sets us free. That's exactly right. I was looking, I was trying to find the verse. Uh, I think, I believe it's in uh, the end of Colossians talking about how, or end of chapter maybe one of Colossians, how uh, we are transferred out of the domain of darkness yes. and we're brought into the kingdom of the beloved son. That happens through the gospel because of what Christ has done for That's us. Right. The last question, and I'll, I'll give you a, a tee ball because we, we've talked about this before, but how do you think that television shows uh, and social media and things of the like uh, portray this kind of supernatural um, element, this, this spiritual element, or kind of pushing us that direction? How do you think that uh, changes the way that we as Christians have become more acceptable uh, or, or more tolerant of these kind of new age spiritual beliefs? Hunter, you answered your own question. Uh, all of this makes us more susceptible and makes us more tolerant of new age beliefs and pagan beliefs. I mean, we're just surrounded. It's, it's almost like a rising tide, isn't it? That's why we always uh, have to be on guard. This is a spiritual battle that we're involved in. Uh, it, we, if we had time, we probably want to spend some time in Ephesians 6 and the defensive armor that Paul speaks about uh, against the wiles of the devil, against the ways of the world. We're in this spiritual battle. Um, 
And, uh, but there is this just broad rising tide of, and I, I spoke to this earlier, um, the evidence of changing worldview right in our own midst, the increasing use of magic, um, the rise uh, of the occult, um, uh, the, the, the use of uh, all these new age and spiritism um, uh, techniques. I mean, it is all around us. It's on television, it's in the novels, it's in our classrooms, and we just sort of get caught up in this. And so that it might have been 10 years ago that we would not have accepted A, but 10 years later, it just seems natural to accept A and to approve of A. I'm old enough to look back over decades, not simply years. And oh my goodness, I, here's where so many of you look at me and say, yeah, sitting up on that, on that stool up there with Hunter, this, uh, this old fuddy-duddy boomer, um, and uh, yeah, he used to walk, uh, he's about to tell us he walked to school, you know, uh, in two feet of snow, barefooted. Well, I, I would never tell that story. I grew up in central Florida, but, um, <laughs> Oh, oh, the sand spurs and the snake moccasins and rattlesnakes that we had to fight through to get to school. Oh my goodness. Um, but, um, you know, it, it just, it, it just seems to be this, it's like a tide coming in. It doesn't seem to let up. It just comes in and comes in. Uh, you, it, have you ever stood on a beach and watched the tide come in and the, the wave breaks and it comes into a certain point before it recedes? The next wave comes in, where does it, it breaks, and where does it advance to? None of you ever been to the beach? The next wave, it's a high tide coming in. The next wave, where does it break? A little further. Just a little bit farther up the beach, yeah. It recedes. The next wave comes in. A little bit farther up the beach, yeah. So a little, little by little by little, yeah. I got to get your name. Uh, little by little, yeah, and it just it's and, and there's just there's no holding it back. It seems that we're kind of in that um, reality today. But here's the thing: I think the reality with paganism, New Ageism, all these spiritualistic philosophies, um, I, and po we talk about postmodernism um, and all that goes with that. We actually live in a world today that probably more closely approximates the New Testament world than the um, world of my grandparents and my parents. Um, I mean, the, the New Testament writers all the time were having to address uh, these uh, various religions and philosophies. That's why the Apostle Paul had to make the distinction they seek signs, they seek wisdom, they talk about, um, uh, they, they talk from worldly wisdom. We have nothing but the cross. We have nothing to do but to preach Jesus and the cross of Jesus and him, Jesus crucified. Um, but they were all the time having to stand against that tide. And that's where we are today as, as um, biblical Christians. But if we, but we remember this that we have the gospel. The gospel is good news. I'm telling you, you take the gospel and you set it side by side with any of these philosophies and worldviews, and one of those is good news, and the other is not. See if you can figure out which one is which. We have the truth, and we have the good news on our side. Let it loose. Spend time with people. Talk about the gospel. Talk about Christ. That's a good word, Dr. Mark, and thank you again so much for being here tonight. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry again to have to be the, uh, the bad guy and cut our time uh, to an end tonight, but I uh, really do thank you for coming. I, I pray that you guys would all be challenged by that, college students, adults. Uh, if you have questions about these kinds of things, again, please use that card. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question, 
I know there was probably another 20 or so questions uh, that if we would have had more time, we could have gone through. So if you have questions, please fill out that card. If, if you want to, you can pass them to the end of the pew, um, and, or you can drop them in uh, at the, the tables on the way out. We would love to be able to follow up with you, uh, to share with you about what the scriptures teach in regards to some of these things, uh, and just to love you well. So again, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, you guys are welcome to stay and hang out for a little bit, but we'll finish up and uh, you guys are dismissed. Thank you, guys. Thanks.